Amen. Does anybody need some victory in their life? Oh, good, about four of you. Praise God. The rest of y'all are fairly victorious, I guess, huh? You know, the Scripture tells us how we gain victory. If you got your Bibles, turn with me to the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, starting at verse 1. I love the letters of Corinthians. Uh, we have these two. My understanding and my studies over the process of time, there are two other letters that were written from Paul to the Corinthians. One of them was destroyed, literally thrown in the fire by one of the appointed or elected leaders of the community. And another one was lost, uh, apparently had been seen, had been heard, uh, read, and one of the, he would send these letters out to the churches in the given area, and they would read these letters. And the fourth one, or the, I, I, if I understand this correctly, what we call 2 Corinthians is actually the fourth letter. But amazingly enough, the two that survived that we have a part of the biblical canon, C-A-N-O-N, not the boom, boom kind of canon. But the, what we have in biblical canon is what we needed. God has a way to give us what we need. And no more than that sometimes. Sometimes there's an abundant, overflowing blessing, but other times it is exactly what we need. And in the letters to the Corinthians, Paul deals with many things that we here in this part of the world, the western part of the world, deal with. Maybe one of the reasons why we are so uh, open to agreeing with the writings of Paul is because he's more westernized in his thinking like us. After all, we are Gentiles, whether you like it or not, unless you were actually descended from the Jewish folks. And so Paul deals with us here about some things, and he shares with us, I, I love the little caption at the top of my Bible section there, it calls this the spiritual war. There is a spiritual war that's been waging for some time now. You won't see it reported on the news as such. You won't read about it in the papers or the magazines or other forms of writing. You're going to know it, though. If you become spiritually aware, you will be aware there is a war that is taking place even now to try to discourage us, calls us to throw down the shield of faith and put down the sword of the Spirit and take off the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness and the truth that's girded up our loins and even the gospel of peace that covers our legs and our feet. Satan wants nothing more than for you to become so discouraged, upset, mad, angry, whatever, to put it all away. Well, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke that. I'm going to say it again. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke that. Not I, but the Lord God himself rebukes that. Hold on. Put a death grip on the shield of faith. Put a death grip on the sword of the Spirit. Put on super glue, gorilla glue, duct tape, whatever it takes to keep it attached to you, all the pieces of the armor of God. Because you're not going to lose this spiritual war. You're going to win. In fact, you've already got the victory. I, I'm sorry. Did y'all say something? I said, you've already got the victory. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory. How? Through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Look at verse 1. Now I, Paul, myself am pleading with you by the meekness and the gentleness of Christ, who in presence I am lowly among you, but being absent I am bold toward you. I beg you that when I am present with you, I may not be bold with that confidence by which I intend to be bold against some who think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we don't war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds, the casting down of arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the very knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience 
Catch it. This is conditional. He will punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. I want to share with you tonight about the great victory we have through godly weapons of warfare. I just want to share with you tonight that we can be victorious in the name of Jesus. Somebody say amen. Father, in Christ's name, help me tonight to share this. God, help me, I ask in the name of Jesus. Father God, Lord, that I might be able to deliver the word to the saints tonight, both here as well as those that are watching by live stream. And Father God, that they would be encouraged, they would be uplifted, they would spiritually, God, be renewed, God, for the sake of their soul and oh, so many others, God, that are watching them, listening to them, paying attention to them as they live for you. Help us, we pray. In Christ's wonderful name, we'll give you the praise in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen and amen. You know, since I've been your pastor, I've tried to make myself available to whosoever, from the youngest to the eldest. And I ran across this as certain churches have this happen to them. I've had it happen a time or two where children will write a letter to their pastor. And I, I've got a few of these here that I'd like to read to you what children Ask the pastor or seek the pastor for wisdom and understanding and even answers to prayer. Dear pastor, please say in your sermon, Peter Peterson has been a good boy all week. I am Peter Peterson, sincerely, Pete, age nine. Dear pastor, are there any devils on earth? I think there may be one in my class. Love, Carla, age 10. Dear Pastor, I know God loves everybody, but he apparently never met my sister. Yours sincerely, Arnold, age 8. Dear Pastor, I'm sorry I can't leave more money in the plate, but my father didn't give me a raise in my allowance. Could you possibly preach a sermon about a raise in my allowance? Love, Patty, age 10. My mother is very religious pastor. She goes to play bingo at church every week, even if she has a cold. Yours truly, Annette, age nine. <laughs> Dear pastor, I'd like to go to heaven someday because I know my brother won't be there, Stephen, age eight. Dear pastor, I think a lot more people would come to your church if you moved it to Disneyland. Love, Laureen, age nine. Dear pastor, please say a prayer for our little league team. We need God's help or we need a new pitcher. Thank you, Alexander, age 10. Dear pastor, my father says I should learn the Ten Commandments. But I don't think I want to because we have enough rules already in my house. I love you, Joshua, age 10. Dear pastor, how does God know the good people from the bad people? Do you tell him or does he read about it in the newspapers? Sincerely, Marie, age 9. Dear Pastor, I liked your sermon on Sunday, especially when it was finished. Signed, Ralph, age 11. My grandson said, he said, Papa, I, I just can't do adult church. It's just too long. I'm going to stay up here in children's church. I said, well, they run the same length we do. He goes, it doesn't seem like it to me. Dear Pastor, I hope to go to heaven someday, but later. Not sooner. Love, Ellen, age nine. And last of all, dear pastor, my father should be a minister. Every day he gives us a sermon about something. Should have read that one on Father's Day, huh? Hallelujah. How do you get victory? Well, first of all, you need to know that you're in a spiritual warfare. You need to understand that you can't fight spiritual warfare with fleshly things. You've got to do it. In the realm of the spirit, you've got to do it with spiritual armament. You've got to do it with spiritual ability. And if you don't, you're fooling yourself. The apostle Paul, in writing to the church at Corinth, had to deal with a problem that was taking place at the church. There were some who were literally stabbing him in the back in his absence and making a name for themselves. I have much I would love to say about that, but I'll restrain myself to some degree. Stabbing the pastor in the back to make a name for yourself doesn't do a thing for you. Not if the people that are paying attention to them, or you as the case may be, really know what's going on. 
If I've ever seen it happen in a church, I've seen it where people who tried to hurt the pastor really hurt themselves in the long run, but they could not see it until it was over. And here's the scary part. I'm afraid that some people aren't going to figure it out until it's too late. I've said before, I say again, for years I've been saying this, the devil does not care how he gets you. All he cares about is that he gets you. And if he can get you with a television program, if he can get you with a style of music, if he can get you with somebody that, that's going by you constantly and causing you to lust after them and, and have desires for them, friend, however he can get you, if he can even get you with somebody in the church who puts on the air of being super spiritual but in actuality are very spiritually immature. Paul told the church there that he knew that when he was with them that he appeared to be meek and, and gentle and lowly. But when he was away, his letters took on a boldness about them because he was having to be bold in his letters in his absence. He had no choice because he was having to literally confront the things that were being said and done in the church in his absence. And Paul it's believed, was a fellow of short stature, a man who was possibly balding. Imagine that happening to a fellow. And apparently not very handsome. And for some, this explained why he was lowly in person and bold when he was not in person with them. In other words, when he was there, he, he kind of gave in to his appearance. But when he was away, he tried to, you know, prevail himself upon them that he was like, you know, six foot five, flowing hair, good looking. We're not stupid. We know why she married him. It wasn't because she liked being Mrs. Santa. I can guarantee you that. I saw some of his earlier pictures. Man, he was a ruggedly handsome guy. Hey, Amen. Yeah, yeah. Not that I pay attention to those kind of things. Paul wrote to them and said to them very clearly, when I get there, please, he said, please, please don't let me have to be bold with you like I'm going to have to be with others. In other words, there's some of you that will receive this by letter that they won't. So when I get there, they're going to find out what they got. One of my favorite scenes in Star Wars is when, how many of y'all know anything about Star Wars? Oh, boy, I get to tell three of you. Hallelujah. That little guy, Yoda, you know, the one with the long, pointy green ears and moving around real slow with that cane. He comes to life in the force. He saw the sun. I mean, he's everywhere. He's bouncing off the wall. He's slinging that sword around, going after the bad guys left and right. And I want to believe that's what it's like for me. I'm not moving as fast as I used to. and I don't have the agility that I used to. But in the Holy Ghost, I have to believe that I am absolutely a ninja. Hallelujah to God. And I'm all over the devil and then some. And Paul said, when I get back, you're going to find out how bold I am in person as well as by my letter. I don't want to do that. So you that will receive this, chill out. But if you can't receive it, you're going to get it when I get there. Hallelujah. Paul said, I will be bold. He said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3, 4, and 5, I was with you in weakness. When I first came to you, with you, I, I stood. With you, I stayed. With you in your presence, I, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom. In other words, if you had heard Paul speak of, uh, on his own, if you will, on his own merit, you wouldn't have heard much. You wouldn't have been impressed with that little short, bald-headed, ugly feller. But, everybody say but. Don't worry, you said it right. Say it again. But, he said, in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men but in the power of God, that's how I spoke. That's how I preached. That's how we operated. That's how we caused the church to come about. It wasn't because of me. It was because of him inside of me. I love something you were talking about before church began. That if we're going to do anything for God, it's got to be done through prayer. It cannot be done because we got hair. It can't be done just because we care. It can't be done because we just share. We've got to pray, pray, and pray some more. Somebody say amen. 
And when we put prayer on the list of things to do for God at the bottom instead of up at the top, we're in trouble. We can memorize scripture all day long. We can read chapter upon chapter upon chapter. But if we do not pray, we're missing it. We're missing it. Paul said that some believed that he was just about as weak as he looked according to verse number 2. But Paul very quickly let them know how wrong they were. He said, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. I watch those guys in professional wrestling. I see these monsters coming out. You know, six four, six eight, seven foot. And then I see these little bitty short guys come out. And man, they were all they like have you ever run into a hornet's nest? I'm bigger than any hornet. I'm bigger than any bunch of hornets. But you get them roused up, I'm out of there. Amen. I I look, I don't have to outrun them, I just have to outrun you. It's not about size. It's about what they can do. And I'm here to tell you, you get Paul stirred up, you get Paul aroused in the spirit, there's going to be some problem for a devil somewhere, some way, somehow. Paul said, I'm not, I'm not doing this according to flesh. I'm not doing this work in my flesh. I'm doing this according to the spirit of God. Paul was just following what Jesus said to do in Matthew 10 and 16. Jesus told his disciples, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves therefore be as wise as serpents and as harmless as doves Woo. hallelujah are you hearing me you, 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 you don't have to come in swinging a big stick like Teddy Roosevelt but what you do need to do is as much as it's up to you pursue peace with all people And holiness without which no one will see the Lord. But more importantly, be harmless. And sometimes I have a problem with that. Sometimes I come across as a bull in a china shop. A very narrow passage china shop. And I happen to be a Texas Longhorn. Just walking through, I knock stuff off. Turning my head, I knock stuff off. Some people are glad to see me coming. Other people are scared to see me coming. Some people would rather I not even show up at all. Well, tough. I'm here. Oh, it's not that way now. But do you understand what I'm saying? Friend, Paul wanted them to understand you got to get to the place where that you, you, like a snake. You know, snakes don't always show themselves until it's too late. Snakes will hide in tall grass. Snakes will hide in, in fallen lumber up under rocks and logs and such. And then when you expose them, that's when you know there's a snake there. And if you're not careful, depending on the snake, you might find out whether it bites or not. A friend of mine sent me a video that was shot by one of their family members. A pretty good size rattlesnake. Let me put it this way. That snake was longer than I am tall. And he was big around too. And the scary part was that snake was not nearly as old as I thought it would be. I thought I I finally got to a place where I could see the rattles on the end of that rattlesnake. And I only counted about eight or nine rattles. And I thought to myself, if he's that long now, how long is he going to be in another three years? We had one up on the, the mountain there during the senior adult retreat one time. They shot it and killed it. They tried their best to get it to go back in the woods, and it would not do it. Instead, it coiled up, and it went... I've never seen so many Pentecostal people dance in all my life. One of them danced with a 45, military style. Pulled out and said, blam. It went down. It was still moving. Blam, blam. It kept moving. By the time I got up, I said, man, you only had to shoot it the first time, but it was dying then. I said, yeah, but it kept moving. I want to make sure it understood what I meant. They held it up. I have a picture on it of it over at the house and they held it up and it was over six feet long it had 12 rattles with a bud on the end of it this thing was was up there and they didn't want to kill it but they also knew that somebody would wind up having to mess with it i'm just glad it wasn't me i'd have found me a fire and threw it off in there in the name of jesus that's what paul did somebody say amen this snake though made himself known and then he would not go away 
but doves. You ever hear them? You ever hear them out there? Every once in a while, I'll hear one. I'll go out the back door and I'll hear one. Sister Nolan doesn't hear it. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll. In a little bit, you'll hear it. And we start talking to one another. I don't know what I'm saying and I don't know what that bird's saying, but apparently that bird understands. Oh, good, there's someone out here I can speak to. And I'm telling you, that dove is harmless. The, the worst that dove can do to me is fly over and anoint me. That's the worst that that dove can do. I've never understood dove hunting, but men go dove hunting. I've been on dove hunts. I went on a dove hunt and got the only dove that we saw, and there wasn't enough left of it when I hit it with my shotgun. I was using seven and a half shot, and I hit it dead on. And they said, Nolan, you're supposed to leave some of it for eating. I said, there wasn't a whole lot there to begin with. If we're going to hunt something, let's go hunt chickens. Somebody say amen. I, there, there's more meat on a chicken than there is a dove. I'd rather hunt chickens. But they didn't feel led to do that, so we didn't do that. Doves are harmless. Jesus said to be as cunning or as wise as a serpent, but be as harmless as a dove. Snakes will, will, will fight back when attacked or when threatened. And, and, and doves never provoke others to attack. Never understood why we hunt them. And yet Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, gave the secret in Galatians 5 and 16, that if you'll walk in the Spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. I'm not, I, I'm not talking about sensual or sexual sins here only. I'm telling you, if you walk in the Spirit, you won't feel any lust of the flesh. Preach. I'm going to preach there for just a little bit. I think I'll just camp out here for a week or so. I said, if you will walk in the Spirit and not in the flesh, you won't fulfill the different lusts that come along in the flesh. You won't give in to the things of, of, of fighting people and, and biting their heads off with your words or trying to come back at them or, or try to run them off the road. Friend, let me tell you, there's some serious troublesome people out there that should not be behind the wheel of an automobile, much less a pickup truck. And I know when they're walking in the Spirit and when they're walking in the flesh. And they're driving more in the flesh than they are the Spirit. Somebody say amen. Paul said our weapons are mighty in God. Paul said that our weapons are not carnal or fleshly. They are not of human influence. They are not of human ability. They are not of human power. The very things we use in this warfare, they come from God. Paul said that these weapons of warfare are mighty in God. Our weapons are from God. Our weapons are in God. Our weapons are of God. Why do we get those from God? So that we can pull down strongholds so that we can destroy pagan philosophies so that we can take the dogmas of professionally religious people and honey there's a bunch of them out there I heard a guy got a doctorate in theology he's a right reverend bishop arch something or another talking about when Jesus came to the place of taking his prominent role. He obviously has never read the Bible. He's read a lot of philosophical writings, but not the Bible. The Word, the Bible says, in the beginning was the Father, the Word, jump in any time, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. Before Jesus was known to us as Jesus of Nazareth, or later as Jesus Christ. He was then, he still is today, and will always be the Word of God. John tells us that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word of God that had been spoken at best had been written down as holy men of old spoke, and someone dictated what they said. 
Now that word has taken on fleshly form. That word, his name is Jesus, which means God save us. Oh, hallelujah to God. The word will save you if you let it. Somebody say amen. And Jesus came down in the form of flesh to reveal to us the will of God, the word of God, and the direction of God. And said to us very clearly, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And no one can come to the Father except through me. Now, how hard is that? If I want to see the President of the United States, I can call the White House. I'd like to speak to Donald. I'm sorry, there's no one here by that name. Click. Oh, we must be proper. I'd like to speak with President Donald Trump. And you are Paul Nolan. Well, I'm sorry. He doesn't have you on a list. You've got to be on a list. You've got to be on a list that's been provided by him. If I was really close to him, he would give me his private number. And I could call him on his private number. But he and I aren't that close. Whether I voted for him or not, I'm not that close to him. So I need to know somebody. And I know a few folks that have an audience with the president from time to time. And maybe I'll get tempted before he's not in office anymore. Say, hey, next time you go to D.C., can I go? I'll drive. I'll pay for the gas. I just want to meet meet President Trump. I can't do that. You know how much God loves me? He loves him more than Donald Trump does. You know how I know? He gave me his private number. Amen? Amen? He gave me his private number. 1-800-CALL-ME-24. You call 1-800-CALL-ME-24 in prayer, you get straight through. Sometimes I can't remember the number. Sometimes all I can do is go, oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. And he hears me. It must be the O part for the operator. Gets me straight through. All I know is this. Ever since Jesus came to this world, he opened up a way to the Father that I can come into the throne room of God himself. And I am able to stand before him in the spirit. And I call out, Abba, Father, hallelujah to God. And he hears me. And he doesn't say, I'm sorry, I don't know you. He doesn't say, I'm sorry, you don't have an appointment. I'm sorry, the office is closed. Don't y'all know how to get a hold of him? This ain't a fleshly thing. This is a spiritual thing. We cast down Arguments through this spiritual warfare that's mighty in God. These spiritual weapons of warfare. We cast down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against the very knowledge of God. We are fighting the demolition of theories and reasonings and ethics and religion and mythology and metaphysics. Subliminal teachings and philosophies that defy the knowledge of God. And honey, trust me, there's more than enough of them out there right now. We have proven there is no God because science, science, I tell you, has all the answers. No, it doesn't. Science has a bunch of theories. I've got a lot of fact. Shout with me any time now. Theories are not factual. Theories are supposed. Theories are just thoughts. But I'm here to tell you, I go beyond those things. For my God is higher than my thoughts. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My God, his ways are higher than our ways. Somebody say amen. We bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. We make our thoughts prisoner and lead them to Jesus. If you're going to have POWs, make sure it's your own thoughts. You sit there and think long enough, you can think of some things that will get you in trouble spiritually. Make them captive to Jesus Christ. And let Christ deal with them. I've said before, I can make an argument for no God. But then what all I've experienced, I can make, make an argument to no God. Did you understand what I just said? Oh, I can make an argument for there being no God whatsoever. But with my experience that I've had and the word of God that's been revealed to me and has been literally fulfilled before me, I have come to a place where I know God, K-N-O-W. I'm here to tell you, friend, if you don't know him, 
There will be no God for you. But if you know him, praise God, there's no worries for you, no sin for you, no hell for you. Somebody shout amen. Oh, hallelujah. Last of all, we need to be ready to punish all disobedience. When our obedience is fulfilled, anything that opposes the work of the gospel in your life, the work of the gospel in your family, on your job, at school, whatever, needs to be dealt with, and it will be when you've been fully obedient to the Lord. Young lady came to her mother. Mom was working a full-time job plus, working as much as 11, 12 hours a day, sometimes six days a week. Dad was working and working overtime to provide the girls everything that they would like to have because teenage girls like stuff, like baskets and things like that. She came up, she said, Mama, I, I, I want to go to so-and-so's house for a party they're having. Okay, well, did you do the dishes yet? No. Okay, well, you, you need to do the dishes first. Mom, I want to go to this party. Okay, well, did you do the vacuuming yet like I asked you? No. Okay, well, you need to do the vacuuming next. Dishes, vacuuming. Get that done. Everything's fine. But, Mom, I want to go to the party. And I looked at her. And I said, you don't get it, do you? All you have to do is wash the dishes and vacuum the house. But it's got two floors. Well, vacuum both of them. I knew what she meant. She didn't appreciate my humor. I said, you don't, you, you don't understand. See, if you do what is expected of you, you can do what you'd like to do. And she immediately turns to her mother and says, Mama, is that true? She goes, yes. That's why I ask you, did you wash the dishes? Did you vacuum the house? So let me see if I get this. If I wash the dishes and vacuum the house, I can go to the party. Yes. But I want to go to the party. I looked at her mother and I said, this child needs to be taken to the hospital. She apparently is brain damaged. Or her earring is messed up because you just told her she could go. But I have to do all that other stuff first. Yes, because if you go to the party, you may not do that other stuff and that stuff needs to be done. Mama let me talk at this point. I said, your mama works her tail off as it is now. Your dad too. To provide for you. And one of the things they do, they will provide for you the ride to go to that party. All they ask you to do is help them. This is a family thing. Help them. Help them. Help them. Help them. I asked on Sunday, did she, this is on Wednesday, I said, did she go to the party? Yes. And, oh, she went home on she washed the dishes, rinsed the dishes, dried the dishes, and put the dishes up. Oh, she really wanted to go to that party, didn't she? She said she not only vacuumed the house, she made the beds. I said, oh, praise God. There's hope yet in that house. And when she showed up with her mama, I said, after I found this out, I said, how was the party? She said, oh, we had a blast. Really? Yeah. And I said, you didn't have to worry about doing anything when you came home. No. I'd already done it before I left. It's amazing to me how many people think that God is absolutely just going to, no matter what you do, no matter what you say, no matter how you live, God's just always going to give you blessing, 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 blessing. And folks, I've read this book through. There are some blessings that are just a surprise moment with God, and there are other blessings that are conditional, that when I do what I'm supposed to do, God will take care of the other things that I couldn't do or that I sh shouldn't have done. Somebody say amen. It's conditional upon me doing what I can. And he says very clearly, Paul says, when you have completed your obedience, God will deal with all of the disobedience. That was for the people who were being obedient. That was for the people who were obeying the will of God for their lives. That was for the people who were not buying into the garbage that was being given to them by the people who were trying to hurt the church and destroy Paul. 
God will deal with them. You just stay obedient. You just stay faithful. You just stay in the Father's hand and let Him hold on to you. He'll take care of them. Good preaching, Brother Nolan, even if you are doing it. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 6, I'm bringing this to a close. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Do you know that Satan every day comes before God to bring accusation against you? Sometimes he does it collectively or corporately as the entire church body, and sometimes he just comes up there and rants and rails about you. That low down Sharon Bowie. Oh, she thinks she's got you fool God, but I know her. And he just goes on and on and on. He comes up with one thing after the other. Poor Sharon. You know what? Your heavenly Father knows you. You are his precious lamb. He knows you. He calls you by name. Satan won't even do that. Because your father, he calls you by name. He speaks well of you. He brags to the others in heaven about Sharon. And all Satan does is won't try to get you in trouble. He loves you so much that he's already forgiving you before you ask it. He knows what you have need of. He wants you to go ahead and ask. But he's already providing it. Now I'm picking on Sharon because she sat close to the front. Guess who else is sitting close to the front? Listen to me. The devil wants nothing more than to destroy you. So he doesn't necessarily fight you with fleshly things. He fights against you in the realm of the spiritual. But that's God's playground. Are you hearing me? He knows what's what. Do you trust him? Paul goes on in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. Tells us to wage the good warfare by having faith and a good conscience. When you've done everything you know to do, let God handle the rest of what you don't know about. Paul speaks about the place where we have secret sins in our life. Not sins that we're purposely trying to hide, but things we've done we don't even know we've done. Things we've said we didn't even know we've said. And Paul says to ask the Lord, Father, forgive me. Guess what? He's already working on that. He's already working on that because you don't know. There are times you literally just don't know that something you said hurt somebody, offended. The word offend means to call someone to turn from the truth. If my offense causes you to turn to the truth, my job is done. But if my offense to you causes you to turn from the truth, then I have messed up. If I offend you because of the Word of God, it's not because I'm trying to go out of my way to hurt you. It's because I'm sharing something that only the Spirit of God knows about. Sometimes He tells me about things about you, and sometimes He does not. I had a lady tell me at one church, she said, well, if you were in touch with God in prayer, you would know everything that's going on in this church. And I looked her square in the eye and said, no, ma'am, because I don't know everything you're doing. She and I didn't jihaw very well. Friend, let me tell you something. God doesn't tell me everything. God doesn't tell you everything. But what he does do is make sure that we are in a position to hear the things that we need. And everything that we need to hear, he'll make sure we're aware of it. In the meantime, pray. 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 Paul goes on. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 8. He tells us that we need to at least put on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, the very hope of salvation. But I like it a whole lot better what he said in Ephesians. In Ephesians 6, verse 14 through 18. To take up the whole armor of God. The belt of truth. The breastplate of righteousness. Your feet and your legs covered with the gospel of peace. One hand the shield of faith. In the other hand the sword of the spirit. And catch this. Always praying in the spirit. 
I'm not talking about for you to be praying in tongues necessarily. When I've reached the conclusion of what I can say in English, sometimes the Holy Spirit through groanings which I cannot otherwise utter will speak to the Father for me. I have literally, I, this woman right here, when we were having the rough time of our life back at the second, third, and fourth year of our marriage, and I about messed everything up, and I finally got myself on the altar and got myself straightened up. I'm here to tell you, I got down to the altar, and every, every time the altar was available, I would go and run there. For we were not in agreement. We were not in fellowship. We were unequally yoked. And I'd cry out to God, and I finally got to the place. I would literally get into the altar, and I would go, Oh, God! And that's all I could say. And I groaned, and I moaned before God, to the point nobody would come and pray with me. They would pray on the other side of the altar area, but not over where I was at. And I got up one Sunday night. Brother Pittman, I'm not praying anymore. I'm done. Nobody will join with me in prayer. Nobody understands what I'm going through. Nobody understands what's at, 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 at stake here, and I'm not going to do it. And he said to me, Brother Nolan, if you have to, tie yourself to this altar. Chain yourself to this altar, and you pray, and you pray, and you pray some more till God answers. So I prayed for you. And I prayed some more for you. And I prayed until God answered. And he answered big time. There was no way I was going anywhere in the ministry. I was going to go do anything in the ministry. Give you an idea of the first six and a half years I spent in ministry at the prison. What does that tell you? God sent me to prison for preaching. The Lord blessed us and, and gave us much there. One by one, God had our piano players paroled. And I came home one Sunday afternoon and I told my wife, I said, I don't know what we're going to do. Brother Jimmy, our piano player, he played his last time for us. Why? What happened? I said, he got paroled. We don't have anybody else. I asked. There's nobody else to play. She said, would they let me play? I said, yeah. My only issue was I had to make sure that, you know, everybody wanted to come up and hug Sister Nolan. They didn't hug me nearly as much as they hugged her. Some guys go back and get in line a second time. For the last two and a half years of prison ministry, she joined me. We came together in ministry. And that's been over 40 years ago. And I thank God for what God did, not what I did, but what God did. All because I refused to stop praying until he answered. So God didn't parole me. He convicted her. Somebody say amen. You got to keep praying. You got to get a hold of that armor of God and not give in. Some of you are closer to the answer to your prayers than you realize. Some of you are at the point of victory. And you just don't know how close you are. Pray one more time. And when you get up from there, pray just one more time. And when you get through there, pray just one more time. One prayer at a time. Until God comes through. You, you won't regret it. It's not wasted time. Hello. In fact, you'll find out if, if you shut up every once in a while and stop trying to do all the talking while you're praying, He'll share things with you. He will make Himself known to you. He will reveal deep things to you Father in Christ's name we live so close to the edge of victory and more times than not we don't realize how close we are we've allowed some 
some yard bird come along, God, and build up a stronghold in our life that gives control to a degree in our life when what we need to do is pray and realize that your weapons of warfare help bring down those strongholds. There are times, oh God, when somebody's empty words cause us, God, Lord, just to go off the rails. We lose it, God. We lose control. We lose peace. We lose sleep. We can't eat. Can't stay focused on our work. And yet, your weapons, oh God, help cast down arguments and every thing that thinks it's higher than you. We absolutely get lost in our thoughts sometime. And through that process of daydreaming, we imagine vain things. When what we need to do is bring every thought into the captivity of you, O oh Lord. Into your obedience. God, if we'll ever get to the place where we'll stop worrying about what everybody else is doing wrong and be obedient in our own life to you, you'll take care of the disobedience of others. Help us, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, help us, O oh God, I pray, that you would be glorified in our life by virtue of the mighty weapons of warfare that you provide. With every head bowed and every eye closed tonight, I sense in my spirit, there's some of you, you've been waging a major war. You have literally, literally been hit, blindsided, had your knees knocked out from under you. But I'm here to tell you, God's about to turn things around. God's about to turn things 100% around. Because you just adjusted your helmet of salvation. You just tightened up the breastplate of God's righteousness. You just pulled to another hole in the belt of truth that's wrapped around your loins and you know that when you march the sound of the gospel of Jesus Christ rings in the ears of your enemy now pick up the shield of faith tighter make that grip tighter make it white knuckle tight and take that sword of the Spirit and use the Scripture that God has revealed to you. And in the name of Jesus Christ, tear it down. Do away with it. In the name of Jesus, be obedient to God so that He will take care of the disobedience around you right now. In the name of Jesus, I speak peace over your home. I speak peace over your job. I speak peace over your heart, over your life, over your family. I speak peace. Not your peace, not my peace, but the peace of God I speak over you now in Christ's name. Be at peace in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Fear will not prevail. Ignorance of the power of God will not prevail. Satan can not prevail. Our God has all power both in heaven and in earth. He has the authority. And he authorizes you to be at peace even with your enemies. And provides you a banquet table. Even in their presence. 
And they can't handle that. Mm, mm, mm. I speak peace over you in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. We've got a full week ahead of us this week. Pray that Sister Nolan prays for Sister or for Brother Nolan. How's that? I'm going to have a great time. I know I will. We got service Wednesday night for our groups. We will be in group session that night. So men will be in here as far as I know. Ladies in there. The youth will be upstairs in the sanctuary. Children will be up in children's church. If you're not here, you won't be there. But always remember, wherever you go, there you are. Words to live by this week. We love you. Shake a hand, hug a neck, tell somebody we love you in Christ's wonderful name. Amen and amen.